for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who today is going to eventually review the album Spare Ribs by Sleaford Mobs. I s Mobs? <laughs> Sleaford Mods. M-O-D-S. This isn't like a gangster movie. I'm going to get to that album soon. But before I do, I like to do something on this channel whenever possible, which is take an album or an artist and use that as a way to open it up to meditations on other things about popular culture, society, etc. So this very evocative, enjoyable, wonderful album, which I suggest you listen to, that's my review off the top, Spare Ribs by Sleaford Mods. Uh, I want, I'm going to make two larger points. Number one, hip-hop both saved and killed punk music. Number two, Americans are not permitted to see certain aspects of British culture. So I'm gonna talk about that curation of British culture eventually, but first let me get to how did hip hop save and kill punk music. Now this album by the Sleaford Mods is made by two apparently middle-aged white dudes from England. And when you say music is made by two apparently middle-aged white dudes from England, you might have a few preconceived notions. I know I do. I'm imagining it's gonna be electronic or it's going to be some kind of punk, right? Uh, I happened to listen to a podcast uh, by a comedian, something Buxton, uh, where he was interviewing these guys, and he opened it up by saying that they were an electro-punk uh, group. Which is funny because when I listened to them, before seeing what they looked like, I just said, okay, these guys are hip-hop. Later on in this interview, the great Iggy Pop himself said that they are the world's greatest rock and roll band. So it seems as though the, the opinion is split. That very few people just see them as being straight down the middle hip-hop music. They see them as either punk and electro or rock and roll. I think it's very clear that this album, and I don't know, I, I should profess my ignorance right off the top, I have never listened to the Sleaford Mods before, I don't know what they used to be like, and I don't particularly care. Actually, I do care. Please put in the comments how this album is different than other albums. Very useful. But for the purpose of this review, I'm not interested. So, when I listen to this, and when I think about what hip-hop can do, part of what I'm trying to get across on this channel is the way that hip-hop is a sort of culture-eating and culture-promoting phenomena. It is able to take the meaning, take the, the content of culture while completely changing its form, using the form of hip hop to consume all other forms of content. And how can it do this? Well, the thing about hip hop that makes it important, and what I think is the way we need to consider it, is we need to de-racialize hip hop sometimes. Not entirely, right? Obviously it was born out of the American ghetto, it was born from African American culture, and that is where you know, the, the cultural uh, center of it will always be. But I don't think it could be limited to that. And part of being a professor of French and studying French hip hop and hip hop from around the world is what I've realized is that hip hop, since it became international, really did become deracialized because it became just the voice of the voiceless. And it was able to do this by being an art form that is so easy to make. As I've said on other videos, it is soccer of music. Rock and roll is hockey. You need the pads, you need the amps, you need the guitars, you need the PA system, you need all that. Hip hop, rap, is soccer. You just need the goddamn ball and something that looks like a net. You just need someone to make a beat and someone to say words. So in that context, when we look at the Sleaford mods and we look at what they're doing, which is talking about life of the working class in England, they are doing something which hip hop does. What's interesting though, is that they're doing it, I mean, it's been done for a long time, right? The British working class have been discussing life of the British working class for a long time, and certainly with punk music uh, and rock and roll before it, you know, particularly, I think of like a band like The Who, I think maybe did it the best. Uh, you know, that has definitely been a, a topic, being a voice of that. But I think that rock and roll and punk is too affected. It's too backwards looking. It's, frankly, they're dying. They're dying art forms. They really are. That's why post-punk is interesting while most punk is not, right? That's why variations on rock and roll tend to be so good, while straight rock and roll tends to just sound so, I don't know, dead. So, what hip-hop can do... And when I'm saying hip hop as a form, I just mean simply a beat and a voice. 
And if you listen to the Sleaford Mods, there are two guys, I don't know their names, I apologize, Adam something. Uh, there are two guys, one of them's making the music, the other's rapping. Now sometimes he sings and sometimes he just sort of talks, but he's doing what rappers do since the mid 70s. A DJ and an MC. And this is what I think is fascinating, is that this album is just filled with punk spirit. Anti-bourgeoisie, anti-consumer, rebellious, fighting against, kicking against the pricks, all that. So in a way, it's saving punk, because it's taking that message that punk was able to communicate so clearly, but it's also eating it and destroying it by showing that no longer is three chords and some guy with a, you know, a, a paperclip in his ear, <laughs> paperclip, what's that word? Clothesline pin? Safety pin, safety pin in his ear, screaming uh, at, at the British flag that that is no longer how that expression of rebellion, that expression of rage gets out. It is now electronic, it is now a beat, and it is now some form of rapping. I think the great benefit of rap, and this is a stupid point that I make, which I don't hear very often, so I make it quite often, is there's a lot of words in hip hop. <laughs> Okay, if you sing a chorus in a, in, a, in a standard rock song, you sing a chorus, okay, that's four lines, and then you have three verses, okay, that's 12 lines. You have like two, three times the amount of words, two, three times the amount of content that can go into a rap song. And in particular, it's not bound by any kind of uh, super stringent formula where you kind of have to have them meet a certain measure and a certain meter in order to work into the song. So that's my first larger point. Hip-hop both saved the content of punk music while killing the form, which interestingly is the same point I made uh, about the album Bob's Son by Rap Ferreira two weeks ago. That, ex that shows you how he took jazz music and hip-hop and poetry, like hip-hop has killed jazz music for poetry. P jazz used to be necessary for poetry, now hip-hop can fill that same role. It is killing the form of jazz for it while maintaining the content, still having that same basic idea, the same soundscape, the same atmosphere that was achieved 40, 50 years ago, but now it's much more direct and I would argue actually better to listen to. Okay, that's my first larger point. Second one is I'm an American. You may be able to tell by my accent. I call myself a French professor, which people think means I am from France, I am not. I don't know any French people who can speak English this well, no offense. Uh, I am a professor of French, okay? But as an American, you know, I'm exposed to a lot of British culture. And what I've realized is that Americans have a very, our view of England has been curated. And I, I don't know if I'm gonna be going on some kind of conspiracy theory here, but we are permitted to see a certain kind of British poverty. I would call it Dickensian poverty. That is to say, the olden times poverty. We're talking 1890. Please, sir, could I have some more gruel? Okay, that is my image of British poverty. Thatcherian poverty, poverty that has grown since the 80s or since the end of the 30 glorious years in 1974, 75, that kind of poverty is kind of hidden from us. Okay, we have a little glimpse through some punk music or, or, or some post-punk music. You know, The Smiths, Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, is a great song. Marcy was able to sing at one point a lot about, about working class concerns. But in general, I would say that we are not really permitted or not really shown this side of British culture. And I think there's an important thing here where as Americans, we are force-fed this image of England, just sophistication, just Hugh Grant right down your goddamn throat all the time, and Colin Firth. Colin Firth and Hugh Grant all the goddamn time. Now, it's okay, they're fine actors. And fortunately, in the last couple of years, that's changed a little bit, you know, Idris Elba um, showing that he's the best actor in England. But just like this kind of image of a sort of erudite, charming, girls find the accent sexy, pasty British dudes uh, is, is emphasizing part of this view of England as being sophisticated. And part of that is tied into this belief in class and the class system and how rigid it is there. And I would say it is a very tacit and sometimes overt 
supporting of a rigid class system, which works perfectly in the post-Reagan, post-Thatcher world, right? Where the wealth gap has gotten greater. So it makes sense that when we watch, oh, I don't know, Downton Abbey, and we think about how great it is, and the, the thesis of Downton Abbey is, oh my God, aristocrats are great. <laughs> Isn't it great how awesome this system used to be? You know, like that's what we get as Americans. We get Downton Abbey. We get love, actually. You owe me, by the way, country of England. You gave me the Beatles and the Clash, but love actually still puts you in the negative. God damn, I hate that movie. Harry Potter, the crown, this whole image of what England is matched with this sort of pro-class division, pro-aristocracy view is a pro-monarchy view. Like I said, we have the crown, we have a weird American obsession with the British royal family. I don't understand. I get angry and tell people to shut up when they tell me about the English family. <laughs> you know, we, we kind of separated from that, that crew a couple hundred years ago. But still, what is it that we're looking for as Americans? I think we're looking for something kind of reassuring. I think in a lot of ways, we use British culture in a similar way that we use nostalgia for the 50s. The same way that Trump uses the sentence, make America great again. We're looking for a time where class divisions and political monarchy are acceptable. We're, we're looking for the, to remove the complexities of democracy, the complexities of working towards class equality. And we take and use these preconceived notions of British superiority and we use those against ourselves, against social equality, against democracy. So, I will say this, you'll see in the background, one of the, one of the reasons I have this theory is that BBC is all over American TV, okay? I've watched all of Sherlock. I even watched the other Sherlock Holmes version, Jeremy Brett. And, you know, I watched Doctor Who growing up and Monty Python and Faulty Towers and Benny Hill. But there's a show that I've only just become aware of. And I've only become aware of it because it was very popular in Eastern Europe and in former communist countries. It is this show. Now, if you're British, you see this and you go, oh, okay, of course, we all know this show. If you're British, I'd like you to know something. No Americans have ever heard of Only Fools and Horses. This show is only known to me because my Serbian wife used to watch this every day back in her home. And why? How does this fit into my theory? How does this fit into Sleaford Mods? Am I even doing a music review anymore? I promise you I am. This is a show about these two brothers growing up in a council house, you know, a project, the equivalent of a project in England, and they're living at the outskirts of society. And the inequality of Thatcher's England and the inequality in this wealth gap and all that horse crap that is so celebrated in most Americans' consumption of British culture is just attacked constantly. Think a little bit of uh, uh, Sanford and Son, maybe only married with children, kind of in that area, but it goes much further. And what's great is that when, if you're English and you know anybody from Eastern Europe, you may think there's a great divide. But actually, if you mention only fools and horses, you'll learn that Serbians consider this character to basically be Serbian. Del Boy is basically a very Serbian style character. And that's the nature of internationalism, of anti-nationalism, of the reason why workers' movements and why socialism and communism are considered to be international. Because the struggles of these people are the same as the struggles of people in Serbia, are the same as the struggles of people in America. The underclass, those who are mistreated. And I think we are not permitted, I had to buy a region-free DVD player in order to watch this, because you cannot find this in America. I think, this goes so much against our vision of what England is. And it reminds us of the inequalities of our own society. It reminds us that this crap is the same all over. Thatcher, Reagan, Johnson, Trump. We are all under the heel of this broken system. Okay. Now I'm ready to do my music review. The good news is, everything I've just said is what I got from the album by the Sleaford Mods. Not the Sleaford Mobs, the Sleaford Mods. That's what I got from their album. All this stuff that I've just been saying, this, the immediacy of hip hop music with just great, pared down, sometimes industrial, synthetic, grimy beats. Not too grimy. Let me take back that grimy. 
half grimy beats, okay? This isn't like It's not that. They're pretty clean, but they're very simple and direct. And then somebody rapping, sometimes singing, the very thick, I suppose working class accent. I don't know enough about English linguistics to say that's the impression that I get. I don't even know where Sleaford is. I assume it's a fairly poor town somewhere in England that ends with a shire, I'm just gonna guess, or upon Essex. You can tell me in the comments which, it, which is it. By the way, if you're a fan and you're mad at me for not doing research, um, it's part of my shtick. So, so you can be mad, but the fact I don't know the names of the artists or where they're from is because I'm trying to take them more seriously and it's actually not interesting if I know what their names are. Not interesting to me anyway. Okay, so everything I said about Only Fools and Horses is how I feel listening to this album. I feel like the, the life that they're describing, the views that they're seeing. Now, I've reviewed and listened to a lot of, of straight British hip hop made by people of African descent, okay? That's a very different, a very different feeling, right? But it is doing fundamentally the same thing. It is trying to be the voice of the voiceless. It is trying to shine a light on something which is usually cloaked in darkness. This is a group which apparently started, based on my minimal research, that does not involve remembering their names, in the time of austerity England. So in reaction to the 2008 crisis, England decided to hurt the poor. As far as I can tell, based on my research, uh, cut welfare, cut a lot of services, and if you look at the disparity of wealth, uh, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. I don't know how that helped them in particular. It doesn't seem like it, it did. But what's interesting is we have, a, a, in a way, an echo of the early 80s in England, right? So we have the 70s, the, the whole system crashed, and then we had lots of more poverty, and we had a terrible right-wing uh, leader, and then we have an economic crash, and then we have a terrible right-wing leader, <laughs> and then instead of punk music coming to save the day, of course, it's hip-hop. So here's what I do. I like to do something called homework where I'm going to point up here in a second and I'm going to tell you what song to listen to. If you've never heard them before and you're interested in what I'm saying, this is the song I want you to hear. I used to play it on the, on the video, but uh, it's just too distracting and I only get to play 10 seconds before the copyright goblins come in and start monetizing. I don't like that stuff. Okay, so the song I'm going to tell you to listen to is what I think a great sample song from this album is, a typical song. It's called Thick Ear. I'm gonna put it up there. And I want you to click on that and then come back if you've never heard them before, okay? I always have to look at the timestamp so I remember where to put it in when I'm uploading this to YouTube. If you ever notice, if you're a fan of this channel, whenever I do that, I look very intently. 1743, okay. So Thick Ear. First of all, the name itself comes from British slang, which is like if you get hit on the ear, your ear gets thick. I don't know, I'm a big Smiths fan, so this made me think of Barbarism Begins at Home, a crack on your head is what you get for not asking. I don't know if that's intentional, but this kind of image is very in fitting with the album, which is partly concerned with COVID, partly concerned with class inequality, and partly concerned with a weird sort of nostalgia or meditations on his own youth in the early 70s, 80s. I don't know exactly. I don't know how old these guys are. I imagine sort of 70s, 80s-ish. Um, and it's very musically raw, sort of intentionally rough uh, hip-hop soundscape. A little bit of punk in there, especially with these guitars that come in. Nice guitar work all the way throughout this album, and it gets more and more punky as it goes on, and even a little bit industrial. The guitar work reminds me of Dead Milkmen, speaking of punk, a band I like a lot. Lyrically, uh, it's just kind of themes of class despair, just sort of, sort of spread all around. Um, in Genius.com, that has all the lyrics, my favorite site to read lyrics, uh, they also include excerpts from an interview in Rolling Stone that the band did. And they describe these lyrics as, quote, kind of surreal. The scenery of destruction that is all around, unfinished buildings, half de demolished buildings, run down warehouses, on their asses, businesses going under. And the image that, that comes, comes most often in this song, which I think is quite beautiful, is isolated coffee drinkers. I am an isolated coffee drinker. This image of isolated coffee drinkers and, and the sparseness and the kind of despair is a great example of everything that this album does. All mixed in with this sort of weird roughness of youth and getting hit on the ear and just the bleakness. And this is the soundscape and the landscape that permeates the album. It's really good. 
I'm now gonna take the rest of the review to go track by track and review the rest of it. That's also what I like to do. That's why my reviews are so long. And, it, and if you're done, if you're done, because you just wanted to hear me talk about Only Fools and Horses, great. Uh, it opens up with a track called The New Brick. And uh, the first track is always important. Obviously, you're announcing what you're going to do on the album. Just very cool synth loop and distorted drums. Kind of a, a fake, happy sound speaking. And it's only 44 seconds, but there's this one line, we're all Tory tired. Now, my mom's name was Tory, so it always makes me upset that the, the bad guys in British politics are called Tories. But still, that's the basic idea of the album, that they are Tory tired. This album is about COVID, this album is about social inequality, and this album is about the roughness of youth, okay? Next track is called Shortcomings, which I had to do a little bit of research on this. It's about some politician in England who I guess if you're British, you're like, how do you not know this guy? Um, I'm an American, even though I'm an educated American, the amount that I know about other countries' uh, politics is sad. Really sad. So it's about some guy who's essentially a political strategist who works a lot with Boris Johnson, and it's a great kind of straight song against this person, something Cummings, I guess is his last name. Uh, but the, what's interesting is there's always a, even though it's a very direct album with a lot of, you know, slang and working class accents and all that, there's a lot of poetry to it too. He's going to get all his dreams. He's got short, short, shortcomings. When did I get so effing down on my knees? Interesting idea. Next track is called Nudge It, a very bitter song, which apparently, according to the Rolling Stone interview, is about rock and roll artists who take on the affect of the working class in a fake way. Whether it's they take on the accent, or they take pictures in front of, you know, kind of working class areas, or council houses, or projects, or flats, or HLMs, or whatever the hell you want to call public housing, <laughs> taking pictures in front of that. I don't even know if council flat is the right term. These are just terms that I hear in my life, but I've never actually looked up the definition. Um, the term that comes up all the time is class tourism. That's what comes up in this song. And it's kind of interesting and complicated because uh, how do we divide listening to this music and liking it or watching Only Fools and Horses and liking it and divide that from class tourism? Because to a certain extent, being interested in other classes is the way that humans build up empathy and then try to improve the lot for other classes whether you're middle class looking at the poor or rich looking at the middle class, right? Like, if we're not interested, if we only watch The Crown, right? If we only go to Buckingham Palace, uh, how do we actually see these other things and how do they improve? But I don't think that's the point of the song. I think the point of the song is just these people who just pretend to be something that they're not. Uh, which, mm, not my favorite part of the album. It seems a little bit bitter, but that's fine. Musically, it's very sparse cool kind of almost Velvet Underground guitars. The chords are in a box form, like they just, like four chords that just go in a box. A nice kind of, uh, a really nice sung chorus uh, as well. Amy Taylor is a guest appearance here. I know her name, <laughs> I don't know the names of the other guys. Um, but it's cool because she breaks up the voice, the kind of like, um, the one person's voice, the singer's voice is good, but it does, it is nice to have it broken up a bit. There's a song called Elocution, which is the best argument for this not being a hip-hop album. It's kind of an 80s-style instrumental. Um, and this has my favorite line on the album. I wish I had the time to be a wanker just like you. Beautiful line. I think what this song is about um, is about elocution. Now, elocution, in, in the Rolling Stone article, he talks about he doesn't know how to communicate. And, and that makes it difficult. I, I think the idea, though, is that elocution, the ability to speak well, and in particular, the ability to manipulate uh, register, okay? So, you know, like, uh, I don't let my kids call me dude. They want to. My son wants to. He gets off uh, his computer playing video games for four hours, and he comes up. He's like, oh, dude, I just, I'm, like, I'm not your dude. I'm your dad. Now, it's not actually that I care about that hierarchy. It's that I want him to know when he has a boss or when he has a teacher that you have to speak in different registers to different people. He doesn't call me sir, okay? But still, I'm not dude. The ability to go in between different registers is actually a key element for social climbing. It's a key element for social mobility and for being able to move out of your station. So this song, Elocution, I wish I had the time to be a wanker just like you, is really about the inability to speak in this way to get yourself out of your station through your language. Beautiful. Interesting idea, well said, a necessary song. A song which I will bring up again many times throughout my life, I can tell, because I talk about language, I talk about register all the time. 
The same reason when I teach French, uh, I, I force my students to use the vous form with me, the, the formal form. Not because I'm a very formal person, but because I want them to know if you're speaking to a teacher in France, you have to know your register. And registers are, in a way, an echo of class divides anyway. God damn it. Why has everything got to be class? <laughs> um, also, just some great writing, too. I mean, I don't think it's as unrefined as it pretends to be at times. Like, this, there's this line, I don't want no donkey straw because I weed in the corner near the stable door. It's kind of a deceptively rich line. And throughout the album, there's all these deceptively rich lyrics, which I think are really quite good. Uh, the music as well, I would say, is also deceptively rich. There's a lot of development, even though it seems very standard, very kind of straight down the middle, it does actually do interesting things that you don't expect. Out There is something of a COVID tale. It's, the beat almost sounds like a weird sample of Time of the Season by the Zombies, it has a kind of ominous feel, and it's about the weirdness of social distancing. Great. I love COVID music. I'm working on my sort of vitties, you know, the, the COVID awards, which I'm going to do uh, when I get my vaccine. When am I going to get my vaccine? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> it might be a year from now. But um, out there, I run my fingers through my hair. I want to tell the bloke that's drinking near the shop that it ain't the foreigners, that it ain't the effing cove, meaning COVID, but he don't care. Just sort of like... The feeling that you had the first time you had to wear a mask and you're just like in this weird world and you don't know where you are and you're uncomfortable and you're unhappy, it's just great. Also, the only reference I could find on this album of Brexit, get Brexit punched. Let's get Brexit effed by a horse's penis until its misery splits. It's great. The whole, this whole song ends with the, the, the line, panic behind the tills, you know, the till, the cash register, which I think is great. I think that's a great way to describe the COVID era, panic behind the tills. Because who's at the tills? The working class people who are forced to go into work and who don't have the luxury of being a bourgeois pig like myself who can do his job remotely. And they have to deal with all the angry people who don't wear masks and don't care and think it's the foreigners. And they're the people who have to deal with it. Beautiful image. Uh, Glimpses is maybe the most straightforward punk song on the album. Just a very long, a strong bass line. Um, a little more poppy. Uh, in Rolling Stone, they say that it's about the falseness of consumer values. That, like, things that we think are worth something aren't worth much. Uh, I don't know. I don't... This song is low on the list for me. It's probably the worst song on the album. In my opinion, it doesn't really go much places. It's got a one-word chorus. It's fine. It's fine. It's not great. Um, top Room... Uh, according to Rolling Stone, they said they really wanted to try the hip-hop thing. I hate to tell you, but you've already done it, the whole album. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, this is a hip-hop album. That's, a lot of people disagree with me on that, including probably most hip-hop fans. So, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm just an isolated coffee drinker. Uh, but the beat, you can tell, is very more consciously hip-hop. And it's all about the, the stress of lockdown. Uh, well, it comes so quick and the frustration and the ain't-no-sleep shit, I think... I want something to come out of my phone that ain't there. Thank you, Sleaford Mods, for describing insomnia of COVID. I have COVID insomnia. I don't sleep very much. I want something to come out of my phone that isn't there. And what that thing is isn't anything in particular. It's just something that'll give me some kind of satisfaction or understanding or clarity or the ability to sleep. I want something out of my phone that isn't there. That's a lot of what COVID is. It's a deceptively po po poetic album. Mork and Mindy, another pretty straight rap beat. And this is apparently, and, and this is funny because I, I read this in the Rolling Stone interview, but I could tell just from the first listen, because he's talking about toys, and I am also a toy collector, another part of my life. Um, and he talks about like Mork and Mindy, Action Man and Cindy. Action Man is like G.I. Joe, but in England. I guess everything has to be different over there. Uh, I don't mess about, I make him kiss each other when my dad and mom go out. So it's this image of his youth, but it's actually fairly bleak. And it seems to be about the sort of, I'm assuming this guy is a generation extra like myself, the weird sort of neglect, the laissez-faire attitude towards parenting that dominated uh, my youth as well. Uh, just this sort of like, eh, just, I don't know, watch TV, play with your toys, whatever. I looked outside. I looked out and throw outside my window. Outside, there wasn't anything nice to see. I wanted things to smell like meadows, not like hell, dying dandelions and bumblebees. 
this is basically straight poetry here, talking about his life, I assume, in the council flats, if that's what they're really called, and the kind of just loneliness and barrenness of his landscape. And that's something which, again, is quite important. The barrenness of the landscape is what makes shows like this interesting. Compare that to the stupid, drafty mansion in Downton Abbey. It's way more interesting uh, to, to see things as they are. Spare Ribs is the title track. Um, apparently, according to the Rolling Stone article, I'm not going to go too far into this one. Um, it's just about, like, homeless people. Like, thinking about homeless... A lot of this album is very kind of a um, train of thought. So it's like it's about, like, homeless people who just need, like, some spare ribs to eat. And spare ribs themselves are an interesting term of food to eat. Um, like, the homeless in COVID and then just hating on Elon Musk for five minutes. Uh, my family is very split on Elon Musk, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of this song, because anything about Elon Musk is interesting. Uh, All Day Ticket, uh, as far as I can tell, this is about working on a ferry. It seems like it's some kind of working class song about having some job to do with boats. It seems to me it's about working on a ferry, um, and it's just kind of a nice sad song that is another working class anthem about the sort of difficulty in the workaday life. I Don't Rate You is the next track. Uh, well, the next track is the one that I started off with, the thick ear. <clears throat> and then I Don't Rate You, a weird song, which is just about basically insulting someone. Um, I don't find this song that interesting because, I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's just like not liking somebody. F off, wanker, you've got famous teeth. Okay. But I'm going to go on a little, little tangent here. I'm fascinated by rap samples, okay? And in this song... There is not a sample, but the singer says, what does it all mean? Like three or four times. And if you're a hip hop head, you've heard this many times. And so I just went on a little journey, a journey through the past to try to find the origin of what does it all mean? Thankfully, whosampled.com, I don't sponsor them, but I would, <laughs> it's such a great website, allowed me to get to the bottom of it. What does it all mean? Was popularized mostly by De La Soul, and their song, uh, Three is a Magic Number, in 1989. I think two years later, How Could I Just Kill a Man by Cypress Hill came out that also used What Does It All Mean? The first band to use it was in 1983, Double D and Steinsky. But the origin of the quote is more interesting and actually plays to a lot of the themes of this album. I don't think this is intentional. What Does It All Mean? comes from Fiorello LaGuardia. If you've ever been to one of New York's two insanely terrible airports, the worst of the two is named LaGuardia, after the former mayor. The mayor, even though he was pro-union in general, was very angry in 1933 at a newspaper delivery person's strike. He was angry because he thought that it disproportionately hurt the working class people of New York, which it did. The, the newspapers were like the internet. And it wasn't that the newspapers weren't being made, is that they weren't being delivered. He thought it was so unfair that he would use the radio, and he would go on the radio and he would read comic strips. He would read them over the radio for the kids, so the kids would still have the access to the funny papers. Now, I don't know. I find this to be a beautiful story. I think it's a very beautiful story about, like, and what he said was, I don't want uh, the silliness of adults arguing to hurt children. And this to me shows what a politician can do in a good way to reach out. And he was serving the people of New York, not to make money. He was serving the people of New York and trying to compensate in one way for this devastating strike, which really hurt the people of the city. On July 8th, 1933, he read Dick Tracy. And in, at the end of this, there's some, there's like a moral of the story is crime doesn't pay. So at the end of the story, after he finishes reading it, he goes, Say, children, what does it all mean? It means that dirty money never, ever brings luck. No, dirty money always brings sorrow and sadness and misery and disgrace. So that is the origin of what does it all mean? Say, children, what does it all mean? Thank you to Double D and Steinsky for finding a record of LaGuardia talking and taking that sample because that is now one of the most famous, like, sampled things over 50 times, I think, on Who Sampled Database. And that's where it comes from.
The final track is called Fish Cakes, which I think the I think Courtney Love could sue them because it is Teen Spirit. It's the same chords as Teen Spirit, um, with just sort of like a little bit more atmosphere put on top of it. I don't know if that's on purpose. Um, all about his youth. Um, what's interesting is like this is a set, like it's about his youth, growing up very poor. Uh, school and houses mangle and the bricks and li uh, lanes of this is jail. Garages and pebbles chime, asbestos acorn trees hang high. At least we lived. It's about the difficulty of Christmas time and being poor. Uh, it sort of reminds me of In the Ghetto by Elvis in a way. Uh, just the sort of like wistful talking about like this poverty, but also emphasizing the strength uh, in front of this, uh, in front of this, you know, despair. Um, but really kind of fits in with this three-part album, right? COVID, class disparity, youth. Kind of how they all mix up together. And in a lot of ways, how the sort of aimlessness, I think, I don't know. I'm predicting. I think, damn it, this album might be really good. It might be, actually. I, I don't know if this is on purpose. I'm just... Spitballing here, right? I, I don't have a script. I just have notes. So I think that this might be an intentional thing where he's trying to compare the aimlessness, the neglect, and the isolation of his youth to the aimlessness, neglect, and isolation of COVID. Perhaps this experience of having to be away from people and feeling like the government doesn't care about you and thinks it's just fine if you die is like mixed in with this, this kind of nostalgia and the feeling. Maybe he's feeling echoes of this neglect and abandonment. And so if you have that, you have the COVID and you have the memories of youth, and then you have the class divide and disparity, that's the second theme I'm talking about, it all comes together in this one album. This is a great album. It's very important, it's very good to listen to, and I'm really happy I reviewed it. Thank you, Sleaford Mods. Where is Sleaford, by the way? Is it a nice place to visit? What will I find if I go there? I don't know. Last time I, I, uh, I reviewed a British band, I didn't know where they were. I learned a lot about it. So there you go. All right, well, until next time, I have to go uh, retrofit my basement. You'll learn about that more in my next episode. And hopefully tonight, I'll watch some more of Only Fools and Horses. Uh, and there's the camera.